Hello, and thank you for joining the 2017 Village Preservation Society of East Hampton's Town Board Candidates Debate. My name is Kathleen Cunningham. I'm the Executive Director and today's moderator. The VPS is a not-for-profit group dedicated to the preservation of historic structures, uh, neighborhood character, and quality of life in the village and town of East Hampton. This is our 35th year of service to the East Hampton community. Each local election cycle, the VPS conducts a debate featuring town board candidates with their opponents in rotating pairs. Each candidate will have a 30 second opening, excuse me, 60 second opening and 60 second closing statement. Candidates will have two minutes to respond to the questions and pairings were drawn randomly just prior to this event. So let's get started. I'd like to start by introducing Paul Giardina, who's the Republican uh, candidate for town board, and Councilwoman Kathy Burke Gonzalez, the incumbent as a Democrat. This is Dem one and Dem uh, Republic, Republican one. <laughs> so um, if you guys uh, would like to, anybody can go for the first, for the opening statement. Who wants to go first? We didn't to choose that. I'll be glad to. Okay. I'm sure that everybody here knows that I'm the only candidate running for town board who has 45 years of experience as an environmental leader and engineer. At 68 years old, I want to take the successes that I've achieved at a national level and continue them in my hometown, East Hampton. The current town board has let us down. Our water has gotten worse. Our environment is suffering. Further, local business is suffering. I'm the guy who protected the water during the Three Mile Island disaster. I protected Long Island's groundwater from Brookhaven National Laboratory. I know I can get results from the pro for, the prob for the problems our residents have said are their priorities. Water quality, housing, beach erosion, and the opioid epidemic. The time for results is now. If you give me the honor of representing you on the town board, I will get it done. I promise. If not now, when? Perfect timing. OK, Kath, your turn. I didn't oh realize gosh. we'd have sound effects. Well, you know, I, I could turn that down, but sometimes I need it. OK. Your turn. So first, I'd like to thank the Village Preservation Society for sponsoring today's event. I'm Kathy Burke Gonzalez. I'm running for re-election to the East Hampton Town Board, having been endorsed by the Democratic Independents and Working Families Parties. I'm also the only incumbent and the only woman in the town board race. I live in Springs with my husband, Joe Gonzalez, our son, Burke, who's a, a sophomore right now at The Ohio State University, and our daughter, Nina, is a senior at East Hampton High School. As a mother, I'm both excited and a little fearful about the challenges my children will face. And as a daughter whose mom turned 95 in July, I've watched how her life has transitioned over the last 20 years. And I bring these life experiences as a working mom and as a caregiver to an aging parent to my job every single day. I'm asking for your vote on November 7th so I can continue to address the pressing needs of our children, our seniors, and our hardworking families. Thank you. Wow, you guys are good. Oh, that was really great. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, you started first, so let I'll start with Kathy with the first question. Fine. Sure. Um, so, um, Kathy, local medical practices report a 55% increase in tick-borne illnesses, and that was a midsummer assessment. What would you propose to control the tick disease epidemic? You know, that's a real challenge out here because it is an epidemic. And quite frankly, we need to, to partner with, uh, with the state, and Governor Cuomo has been out in front of this, and with the county. Bridget Fleming has been working. She's put together a committee that's working at the county legislator level. And we've also seen uh, direction from our senator, uh, Kristen Gillibrand, to help out on this. Uh, fortunately, Stony Brook Southampton Hospital has taken the lead. They now have a tick-borne disease resource center. Uh, we've got a tremendous doctor here in our community, you know, uh, Aaron McGinty, who's on the forefront of all of this. And, uh, you know, we know that it's, you know, folks like to think it was the deer that was carrying the, the tick-borne illnesses. We know it's the white-footed mouse. And we need to partner with all of these uh, levels of government in order to move forward. Okay. Well, thank you. That was a really short answer. It was a minute. Um, Paul. I also believe that the tick-borne disease problem out here is significant. Um, the most important thing we need to look at is the management of all the species out here. I'd like to actually quote you. 
when you talked about deer management, we need to manage deer, but we need to manage all of our flora and fauna. So what I would propose and what I'm hoping for is a comprehensive look at everything out here that can be controlled in getting an ecological balance so that we can do that and get ourselves to a point where tick-borne diseases and ticks are reduced. But to think that just mice and rats are the only cause or that deer aren't involved is short-sighted. And I believe in ecological balance for uh, any kind of solutions that involve these issues. Okay, great. Thank you. You guys are being very efficient. It's wonderful. Okay, Paul, we'll start with you on this one. Um, the Village Preservation Society has long been involved in trying to find solutions to the deer management problem. While ultimately VPS is agnostic on which methods are used, the society proposed sterilization for the village as a middle ground to doing nothing or a professional call. Are you familiar with the town's adopted deer management plan and what non-lethal methods might you recommend? I think, again, let's talk about ecological balance. Um, one of the issues that came up was the four poster program, which we could apply to deer to get rid of the ticks on them. The way I look at deer management in this town, again, it has to be done holistically. We have to look at deer, we have to look at rabbits, we have to look at mice, we have to look at chipmunks. And frankly, we need to reduce the deer population in this town. And um, as far as the deer management program that the town has proposed, let's put it in place. Let's take a look. Okay, great. Thank you. Um. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the deer management plan was uh, adopted by the town board, was under the Wilkinson administration in uh, June of 2013. Dominic Stanzione was the liaison to, to deer management at the time. Now Fred Overton is our liaison. It was a 48-page report. I believe there were about seven different recommendations in that report. Uh, the non-lethal, you know, we talk about the sterilization project, the White Buffalo project that was done in the village, and I know uh, that the Humane Society said it is the most humane way to, to do it, uh, to, to deal with the deer population. However, you know, there was a big backlash in this community, and I know a lot of people uh, felt that it was a little gruesome, you know, when we still see the deer out there with the tags on the ears and things like that. And, uh, you know, I will say that my record on the town board, I have voted to expand hunting. Uh, you see that the only predator to the deer in this community are hunters and, and vehicles. Uh, ironically, when I went to the GGG meeting, I guess it was September of my first year in office, uh, myself and Fred Overton was invited to the GGG. I was to talk about the airport and he was to talk about deer. And I expected, you know, all the, you know, excitement would be around the East Hampton Airport. And was I wrong? You know, everybody wanted to talk about the deer. Everybody had an experience where the, the, either themselves or a loved one had had an accident, some seriously injured, cars were totaled. Um, and it's something that we need to address, and we're addressing it through our land acquisition department. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so this will start with you, Kathy. Sure a topic with which you're familiar. Aircraft noise oh, okay. is a big quality of life issue in East Hampton for village and town residents as well as communities all over the East End. Do you support taking FAA funding knowing that relinquishes the town's ability to control its property for 20 years from the date of the grant? And how do you propose to address aircraft noise impacts on village and town residents? The third part of this question is really important to our group, which is, um, when legally possible, what is your position on closing the airport? Okay. So I do not uh, propose to take money from the FAA. If you recall, I was uh, sworn into office on January 1st, 2014, and the four grant assurances expired at the end of 2014. And we were had the what we would call the bishop responses that we had gotten from the FAA that said if we did not take money, we could put into effect reasonable uh, non-discriminatory access restrictions, which we followed. Um, as far as proposing how to address the impact of aircraft noise, 
uh, as you know, because you were part of the process, we, we went through and came up with three restrictions. Unfortunately, they were struck down. So tomorrow at the town board work session, we will be discussing the Part 161 application and whether or not the town is going to move forward with it. We had a work session uh, back in September where we had our attorneys from Morrison Foster come in, explain the steps, explain the timeline, the money involved, and tomorrow the board will be discussing that. Uh, because that is our way forward to get reasonable access restrictions that will bring meaningful relief to the community. And I am not in support of closing the airport at this point. Okay, great. Well, that was a concise answer for a long question. Paul, your turn. I am also not uh, one of the people who want to close this airport. And I do want to take FAA funds okay. if it is necessary for safety and improvements at the airport. I believe that the airport is an asset. And 12 years ago, when I was asked by the late Tom Toomey what process uh, needed to be followed after I said, when I, I had the EPA noise program, that the EPA noise program had no uh, charter over airports, I said the 161 process. I have a problem with the fact that this advice has been given to Kathy a couple of years ago and to Steve Latham, all when they've asked me. So we've wasted $2.5 million or so in litigation when we could have an answer at once, uh, on what part 161 and how to get noise, uh, noise reductions. The real problems are the helicopters. The real problems are aircraft like that. And they're not going to go away by closing the airport. The airport noise will continue, or the aircraft noise will continue, because Helicopters can land any place. Seaplanes can land in uh, Sag Harbor. So what I'm calling for now, if I get elected, and in fact beforehand, until we can get a 161 read and a process to go forward, I'm asking the helicopter people and those who have that noisy aircraft to agree to a voluntary curfew starting at 8 o'clock in the morning and uh, ending at 8 o'clock in the morning and starting at 9 o'clock at night, with the possible exception on Monday mornings at 7, and also, and also for obvious safety reasons. So if people want to know my position, there it is. Keep the airport open, take the money, and let's go with a voluntary thing until we get 161 done. Okay. Um, okay, Paul, we're going to start with you on this one. Uh, what is your position on groundwater management for the town? Uh, what role does local zoning play in relationship to nitrogen loading and other challenges to ground and surface water purity? Do you believe that a town-wide agency should be put in place to monitor and protect our water resources? And how can local government help? Basically, 1.3 million gallons of water a year are um, purified by our on one acre. So the prime way we handle groundwater is to buy land over aquifers and to use it that way. And that's where I think the CPF funds are to be used in the best ways. We have come up, so that's purifying and protecting what we have. The next thing is what do we do about the septic issues we have? We have a plan. The Republicans have put together a plan, which I helped author, which would target pre-1995 um, septic systems near water bodies. These are the ones that have never been inspected, never been approved by the Suffolk County Department of Health. When they are proven to fail, we have a plan that would allow, one, the homeowner, the homeowner to go forward and make a, a replacement with a low nitrogen system. Two, if we would be glad to, create water districts around the 10, um, the, uh, the 10 watersheds and actually seek federal funding. There is a $2.2 billion federal fund just for New York State just to do this. The town's never acted on it. The town has never even gone after it. To do this, we could meet all of our needs. Right now, I estimate between $100 and $200 million are needed to take care of the septic problems in this town. And the only way to do it is not $5 million a year from the CPF, which is best used to preserve water and groundwater, 
but to use the federal fund. Okay, great. Thank you. So protecting our drinking water, our surface waters and harbors and bays is our number one priority. We had a, a referendum in November of 2016, 78% of the voters said that they wanted to extend the CPF to 2050 and also allow for up to 20% of CPF monies to be used for water quality protection. So there's a number of ways, you know, that we can protect our groundwater. One is, is, as Paul mentioned, land preservation. So when we got into office, we put together two different outreach programs. One was the Lake Montauk Outreach Program, and we have acquired 30 parcels under that around Lake Montauk, you know, uh, where we've got wetlands. We also did, a, in the process of doing a Springs Outreach, where we've acquired 38 parcels. Not only are they on, you know, a number of them are on Gerard Drive and Three Mile Harbor, but they also give the community access to those water bodies. We've now passed legislation, the strictest on Long Island, for septic system upgrades with the low nitrogen sanitary systems. Uh, we are uh, increasing our testing and monitoring of our, our water bodies. We've got individual uh, watershed plans. We've gotten $650,000 in grant money alone in Springs to do Pussy's Pond, Akabonic, and Three Mile Harbor. Uh, we've got oyster gardens growing in, uh, over by Gann Road, which is filtering the nitrogen, and we need to do education and outreach. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so Kathy, this one will be... I believe I get Oh, to... I beg your pardon. No, you just, you just talked about it. You talk first. Yeah. I, I don't get a chance to rebut. Well, um... We didn't plan a rebuttal okay. in here, but you okay. know you can. Um, okay. We can use a little time at the end if you Thank feel you. like you have something you want to say, and you should feel okay. free. You know, we'll we'll give you each a minute to do that at the end. Let me just remember to do that now. <laughs> okay, so um, next question. I'm going to start with Kathy. Sure. Um, the village has long served as the cultural, commercial, educational, and religious center of town. The, c this, the congestion this imbalance creates has become untenable and has had a deleterious impact on quality of life for village residents. As the town grows, how do you see uh, meeting the needs of its residents without placing further burdens on the village of East Hampton? And please be as specific as you can. Sure. So right now you know that we're in the process of a Hamlet study. We started that in May of 2015. It's been a very, I'm sorry, May of 2016. It's been a very public process. Uh, presentations were made in June of this year and actually uh, we were asking for responses to the plans, uh, the draft plans, by September 30th and most of them have already, we've gotten quite a few responses from CACs and individual community members. Uh, what the Hamlet studies are trying to do is to see how our centers can function better, how we can move vehicles better, pedestrians, bicycles, how we can improve parking efficiencies, uh, improve in infrastructure, address any zoning issues that we need to address, and support our local businesses. Uh, we are also working with the Long Island Railroad. They're looking to put on shuttle trains in the fall of 2018. I've been to a number of meetings that have been sponsored by Assemblyman Thiel, uh, so that the, along the lines of what was happening when County Road 39 was being paved. and because we have folks that are, I'm, for instance, I was just talking to someone in the parking lot of the YMCA who now that they're raising, um, you know, the tunnels over by North Main Street or the overpass, uh, there's buses only coming out here and not the Long Island Railroad, and it's been, you know, really challenging. We also had a circulator bus that went through Montauk that we've had, the Hampton Hopper that took people around, and there were 20,000 individual rides uh, on the Hampton Hopper in the nine weeks it was uh, operating in Montauk. So those are the types of things that we, we need to address and we're working on. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Paul? Clearly, we need to get cars off the road. That's where the issues are. The Hampton Hopper is a great idea. I sat down with Alex Esposito, who runs one of the companies who uh, does the mini rides. Mm -hmm. What we need to figure out is how to get people from places like the railroad to their destination, whether that be John Marshall, whether that be the spring school, and do it in small amounts so they don't have to bring their cars, so they don't have to clog up Route 27. We need creative public partner ideas that can do this, where the advertising on the vehicle or some other means can go forward, finance it without town money being spent. 
But clearly the issue is getting people out of their cars, especially one at a, one at a, at a time. And there are a lot of creative solutions. The problem with the Long Island Railroad and, and getting that done is getting an efficient way to get people to East Hampton. As Kathy pointed out, for a long time this railroad is going to be down as the trestles are put up and, and, and put together. So it's a complicated situation, but the most important thing is to have the wherewithal to have the resources to deal with the points where the people can come in efficiently, which is the jitney stops and the railroad. And that's the key. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to just try one more question, I think. Uh, and it uh, piggybacks on what we just discussed. And Kathy had the last one, so I'll give it to Paul. And then I'll give you each a minute to rebut, and then we'll move to our next pairing. Sure. Um, the LIRR, re this is for you first. The LIRR recently unveiled plans to heighten and reconstruct the North Main Street and Akabonic, uh trestles in the village. Why hasn't the Stephen Hans Path trestle been um, raised and improved instead? Because widening that trestle, which has long been on the Village Preservation Society LIRR wish list, would have far less impact on the community during construction and would have rooted truck traffic around the village rather than push it north on both North Main and, and Akabonic Road. As uh, trucks heading north in that direction anyway are already headed out of the village and into town. So um, it's an issue for village residents. What would you do to address that? Well, first of all, I agree. And I asked the same question, why wasn't it looked at? There are a number of reasons for doing that, even, even for safety reasons. First of all, um, the area floods completely. It is not that hard to raise the embankment that takes that tr the train from where it's coming from and over. So it's not a, a hard thing to do. So I'm con I am assuming it's all an idea of money. And yes, this is exactly what we need to have another thoroughfare to get commerce to the springs, to northwest, to other areas. So I would support that. I would consider asking for funding to get that done. I think it should be done with this We've apparently missed the boat on this, but there's a sec we should have a second chance to get that, uh, that trestle raised. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kathy? Okay. The request was, was made. I know that the East Hampton and the Sag Harbor CAC uh, made the ask. Uh, we reached out to the MTA, and it's, they're, they're the decision maker in, in this situation, and they chose to do those two trestles. Okay, well, that was fast. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's go into a, a rebuttal phase, which is something I wasn't really planning on, but I think it's a good idea to sure. respond to that. And I'll give you each a minute if there was something you wanted to address. Um, and, Paul, I'll start with you. I want to go back to the water quality issue. Okay. Um, you asked, should we have a master agency here? Mm -hmm. Let me start by saying the original water quality management plan was done four years ago under the Wilkinson administration. And basically nothing was done with that until recently. And in election year politics, we see things like the Pussy's Pond effort that Kathy was talking about and the Montauk effort to um, put together a grant to look at the septic issues there. Um, Pussy's Pond, everybody got an award. Larry Cantwell made the statement, the way you get people to come to, politicians come to a meeting, uh, give them an award. I have a question. Did the solution that was put in place work? How do we know? Are the levels of nitrogen lower since that happens? I don't think so. The question is, how come I could not, or nobody could have gotten the grant application before it was sent in, or the actual tasks for the Montauk thing? We need a professional engineer running this effort. Okay, thanks. Okay. Well, I was actually going to rebut on the airport, but I'll okay. start with water quality. <laughs> um, so, you know, we followed a tremendous process, and my hat's off to Kim Shaw, the Director of Natural Resources, and her staff, particularly Melissa Winslow, who's assigned to this project, the water quality project. We went through a very methodical process. We put together, I believe you're talking about the wastewater management plan that was done, that was started under uh, the Dominic, Sylvia, and Peter uh, pursued. And then what we did was we put together a water quality plan prior to talking about the, uh, before the referendum, we went to referendum once that passed, uh, we st 
drafted legislation. Suffolk County got the, the, the four um, septic systems online, and we moved forward. So, you know, I think we can handle this in-house, um, and I believe that, that Kim has done a tremendous job. As far as the airport's concerned, we have a voluntary curfew in effect right now, uh, and we've tried, we've brought in stakeholders from community groups, but also we've reached out to the operators, uh, and uh, they don't want to play ball with us right now. But why is water quality okay. still going down? Okay, hold on. That's it. That's the end. Thank you. Very lively. I like that. That's what this should be about. Um, stay tuned. Our next pairing will be in Jeff Bragman and Jerry Larson. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is our second pairing of the VPS 2017 Town Board Candidates Debate. To my right is Jerry Larson, the Republican candidate, and to my left is Jeff Bragman, the Democratic candidate. We'll go through the same set of questions that we gave Kathy Burke Gonzalez and Paul Giordina, and each candidate will have one minute at the end to rebut. Um, we decided to add that earlier. It seemed like a good idea. But we'll start with their opening statements, and Jerry Larson will go first. Okay, Jerry. Thanks, Kathy. I'd like to thank the Village Preservation Society for holding the debate. I'm an Independence Party member endorsed by the Republican Party and the Conservative Party. I'm a lifelong resident of East Hampton, have raised six children with my wife, Lisa Mulhern Larson, who grew up in Montauk. I recently retired from my position as Chief of Police with the East Hampton Village Police Department after serving the community for the last 33 years. I currently own and operate with my family a security company. I'm running for town board because just like in the police department and the emergency 911 communication center, I can make a positive difference for the residents, business owners, and employees of East Hampton. East Hampton is in serious need of leadership that will listen to all its residences, I'm sorry, residents, business owners, and employees. I'm proud to have received the support of the East Hampton uh, employees in this election, including the written endorsement from the East Hampton Town Police Union and the written endorsement from the East Hampton Police Union, uh, Village Police Union. The East End Police Conference, the Suffolk County Conference, and the Suffolk County uh, Coalition of Police Unions. The employees of East Hampton understand that a strong leader is needed, and I'm the leader they chose. Thank you, and I look forward to listening and working with everybody in our town. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jeff, your turn. Hi, Kathy, and thanks to the Village Preservation Society. I, um, I asked to join this campaign because uh, I think of and know East Hampton as a real community serving real needs. For me, it's not a brand name, it's not a reality television show, and it's not the Hamptons. I've spent uh, 30 years living here. Uh, I started a small law practice focusing on local issues, and during much of the time that I was working, I was a working dad. I raised my son, Walker, who uh, graduated from local schools and uh, uh, is still interested in being here if he can. I have a record of fighting for environmental protection and the things that we care about in East Hampton. It's history, it's water and the natural resources, which I think the community understands pretty well are worth more than dollars and cents. And that experience has taught me to listen to residents. Uh, I know they've got a lot of local knowledge and I believe that uh, if we learn to talk to each other a little bit more and maybe shout at each other a little bit less, we'll get more done. I'd like to help out on the town board to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so Jerry, you went first. So I'll start with Jeff with a question. Okay. Okay. So, uh, local medical practices report a 55% increase in tick-borne illnesses, and that was a midsummer assessment. What would you propose to control the tick disease epidemic? Well. Um, you know, I think it's important to understand what's causing the transmission to humans. Uh, I think the t subtle topic here is deer, deer, but what causes the transmission to humans is the white-footed mouse. Uh, there's a product out called Daminex, uh, which you can put around the perimeter of your property, and, and the mice pick up these cotton balls, they nest with it, and it breaks the chain of causation uh, between the deers, which host the ticks, then they come to the white-footed mouse, and that's who gets it to human beings. So in tr if the question is about deer, uh, I think the bigger it's question not, is, uh, okay, well, um, I know the county is uh, working on uh, a very large uh, project to, uh, on the medical side, and um, our county legislator, Bridget Fleming, is working on that. And uh, I would encourage actually less spraying of our lawns because it has other 
bad impacts, more use of products that are known to work, and prevention is a big part of it, frankly. I walk in the woods with my dogs all the time. I wear the right clothing. I stay in the paths. I have had Lyme disease, so I know how bad it is, and I don't want to minimize it. But I don't want to go crazy about with uh, spraying and uh, taking other measures that really don't relate to what causes Lyme disease in people. OK. You had a little time to spare, so that's good. <laughs> OK. Um, Jerry. Your turn, Jerry. I also uh, believe Lyme disease is a very serious problem, and, and I also suffered from it. So I understand the uh, significance of it. Um, I do believe that the uh, white-footed mouse and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the mice are, are a major problem. And I do believe, and I use that product that you just mentioned with the, uh, the little tubes and the cotton balls, and you take it back to their nests and they kill. There's also a product that they are that uh, they're talking about with the deer is this four poster program where the deer stick their head in this feeding trough and, they, and it gets the, uh, um, some sort of a chemical on them that will keep the, the ticks off the deer. So, I mean, I think a combination of all these things need to be, to be done to help us prevent Lyme's disease. I mean, it's, it's definitely something that affects probably almost everyone on the eastern end of Long Island. Okay, well that was fast. Okay, great. We're, we're plowing right through. Okay. That was question one. That <laughs> there's more weight. Okay, weight. there are. There's more. Okay, so Jerry, we're going to start with you on this. Uh, the Village Preservation Society has long been involved in trying to find solutions to the deer management problem. While ultimately VPS is agnostic on which methods are used, the society proposed sterilization for the village as a middle ground to doing nothing or a professional call. As you know, you can't hunt every place in the village. Uh, are you familiar with the town's adopted deer management plan, and what non-lethal methods would you recommend? Well, I was actually, I don't want to say part of the village program, but I was assigned by the village board to assign men or women, whoever were working, to um, take the shooter around when they were doing the sterilization program. And I witnessed firsthand the program, and I, I, I don't agree with the program. Um, maybe it was done at the wrong time of year because a lot of these, these deer were, were pregnant at the time. So it caused problems down the road for these deer. So I think we need to do a real comprehensive study of the deer population and see. I mean, it definitely seems like we're overpopulated in the village, but in some parts of the town maybe we're not. But we need to do some sort of scientific study to come up with the real population and then figure out how to deal with them. Personally, I'd rather see a cull than what they did to the deer in the village. That's just my personal feeling. Okay, that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Jeff. I, uh, I'm not a fan of what the village proposed and tried to carry out. I think that sterilization, frankly, was uh, a little inhumane and uh, caused needless suffering, and I don't think it was very effective. Um, I would agree, actually, that I think it would help if we had some real science that we knew uh, in the town and in the village if, if there is an overpopulation of deer. I'm not, I'm not, I think the jury is still out on that. I'm not sure whether there is or there isn't. Uh, I think that a better technology, uh, and, and I'm not, um, I don't think I'd vote to expand hunting, um, and I don't think uh, my first reaction would be to call the the herd if there is a deer problem. There's a relatively new technology where they dart the deer. There's um, a birth control chemical um, that they can uh, specifically target to the deer. It's not in feed that would you know, go on the ground that other mammals could pick up and eat so it doesn't spread into the ecosystem. And I think that that has um, uh, some value and probably should be examined. And I believe they used it on Fire Island and actually solved their, their deer problem using it. And it doesn't, it doesn't harm the deer. Um, they're capable of reproducing once they stop darting them with the drug. Um, so my preference would be a softer solution that would be darting the deer. I'm OK with the hunting that exists. I don't want to expand it. But the sterilization, I, I really found uh, uh, I, I, I could not uh, support that. OK. If I could just add. Uh, Save it for your rebuttal. 
Oh, I thought I had a minute. Not after each question. No, I just yeah, okay. we don't have that much time, sadly. <laughs> okay. I wish we did, but we're uh, yeah, just but make a note so no, that's okay. so when you have yeah, your I'm time, fine. you'll know. Um, okay, that was Jerry. This is Jeff. So um, I'm gonna start with you on this one, Jeff. Aircraft noise is a big quality of life issue in East Hampton for village and town residents as well as communities all over the East End. This is a three-part question. So. Um, do you support taking FAA funding, knowing that relinquishes the town's ability to control its property for 20 years from the date of the grant? Uh, how do you propose to address aircraft noise impacts on the village and town residents? And when legally possible, what is your position on closing the airport? Well, I think of all the people that you're going to interview for town board, uh, I've been working the <laughs> longest on airport noise because long before anybody was even talking about it, I was fighting it in court. We were uh, then fighting a uh, Republican town board that was uh, very determined to take FAA funds. So the answer to the first question is, would I take FAA funds? No, I would not. I don't want to federalize the airport. I don't want to tie our hands. And we spent uh, probably five years in court going up and down, and there was various, there were various motions. Um, to challenge the, uh, the then town board's environmental impact statement. And um, the, our primary criticism was that they used a measurement that actually erased any impacts. It made it impossible, really, to determine if there were noise impacts. I don't think there's much of a debate now. We may have lost that case, but sometimes you win by losing, because I think uh, we changed public opinion. And now I think it's pretty widely accepted that airport imp noise impacts are serious. And even if they don't hit everyone in town, uh, other residents are concerned about what airport noise does to the quality of life. I know it when I'm kayaking occasionally out on uh, Northwest Creek or Northwest Harbor, and you feel like you're in paradise and there's, there's no houses around. But the minute a helicopter comes overhead, suddenly you know, urban life comes back at you. Um, the situation that we're in requires us at this point to do a Part 161 study, which is like an environmental impact statement. You're dealing with the FAA. I'm not sure the FAA is a great partner on controlling noise, but we have to do it, so that's what I would do. And, you know, my position on the airport, uh, its existence is this. I live a couple miles away from the airport. For years, I had no problem with the airport. To me, you know, the local small plane pilots were kind of a part of life, and in a way, they, were, they fit with the rural character. That was then, this is now. Now we have helicopter you know, share rides being offered. I oppose it. I think if we can't control airport noise, I think the residents of the town do have the right to decide whether they want to have an airport or not. OK, thank you. All right. Jerry. I think we're in a fortunate place where we don't need to take FAA funding. I think the airport makes a, a good deal of money, and it's self-supporting. So to answer that part of the question, no, I would not accept. I don't think we need to accept FAA funding. Uh, the noise is, is definitely a problem, um, but I think the town went about it the wrong way. They should have initiated this Part 161 originally and not violated the federal law, and we wouldn't have wasted $3 million and then, um, you know, been in the position we're in now if we would have started this process back, you know, four years ago in 2000, uh, well, actually in 2015 when they, when they, uh, when they filed those three pieces of legislation we wouldn't be in the position we're in now. And then the other thing we found out is that the money may be coming out of taxpayer funds now. Um, the town has not been forthcoming with that information, but there is a Part 16 pending that could reverse or could order the town to put the money back out of the general fund into the airport fund. So again, if we were to just follow the rules and do the way we're supposed to be, we would have been in the same position we are, we would have been spending the money for the first time. Um, and no, I do not, if at the end of the day, if everything fails, I do not support. What would I do about the noise? I think we have good opportunity right now to meet with the helicopter associations, and I disagree with the current town board. I think we have the leverage right now to work with them and force them to do voluntary compliance. Um, and no, I do not support closing the airport. I think it's a uh, public safety issue one, and I think it's an economic engine for our township. Okay, great. Okay, on to question four. So, Jeff, you started with the last one. So, Terry, you'll start with this one. What is your position on groundwater management for the town? What role does local zoning play in relationship to the nitrogen loading and other challenges to ground and surface water body purity? 
Do you believe that a town-wide agency should be put in place to monitor and protect our water resources, and how can local government help? Obviously, the water, uh, our water, our surface water and our groundwater are a huge concern and um, a valuable, valuable asset, which without it we have nothing here on the east end of Long Island. Um, I know the town has instituted a, um, a program where we can uh, start replacing some of the septic systems. Um, I know there's a big push to do a septic system in Montauk, the municipal septic system. That's been sitting on its heels since uh, 2014 when the study came out and said it should happen. 2015, the town had a, a, a meeting out in Montauk to try to see who was interested in going forward. There was a big turnout. Then that was an election year, so we got the motivation out in Montauk going. Then nothing happened until March of this year. The CCOM actually had a meeting, asked the town what's going on with our municipal septic system. Nothing, nothing was going on. And then in July of this year, the town gave P.O. Lombardi $46,000 to do a more focused study than the one they had done in 2014. It's a serious problem. We need to get moving on it. We need to get it done. And it's, it's just been dragging and nothing's been going on. So I'm definitely in favor of, uh, of the Montauk septic system. I'm in favor of um, uh, moving forward with uh, the individual. The, the town has identified, do I still have time? Yeah, I've got okay. 30 seconds. I'm sorry, I'm speaking really fast. Yeah. No, <laughs> you're doing was, great, you're doing uh, great. The yeah. time, yeah. Um, the town has identified over 12,000 septic systems that need to be replaced. And um, you know, the Republican, um, my Republican running mate, uh, who worked for the EPA for the last 40 years, has a plan in place. Uh, we can use this EPA revolving uh, fund of $2.2 billion. Um, and I think we can, we can hit it from a much bigger perspective than doing individual septics over a 30 year um, amount of time, because we're only getting the $5 million a year, just under $5 million a year from the CPF fund. So I think we can do a much better job and, um, okay. and get it moving faster. Great, thank you. Well, you know, there's a lot of talk about protecting the water, and it's actually something that um, I've done on behalf of neighbors for much of my 30 years as a local lawyer here. I mean, just this last spring, the neighbors at Cedar Street asked for some help uh, to look at the environmental impacts of a, of a bus yard that was proposed to be put in. And we discovered that it was extremely close to nearby public water supply wells. And we were able to, to stop that development from going forward. And really much of what I do in protecting the environment relates to the protection of water because it's the fundamental issue in East Hampton. Um, I think the town board has made a, you know, a pretty good recent start um, on, on really turning back uh, the impacts that nitrates have had. Their, their septic replacement, their uh, credits that they're giving to people who are going to build new houses or do substantial renovations on houses, I think is a smart idea as a part of sort of a multi-pronged approach. Um, I've looked at um, the other side's proposal uh, to go uh, and, and borrow a, a really kind of a breathtaking sum of money to do some kind of major um, change in septic systems. And I don't, I think that I w it's tempting to say we could borrow all this money and that would solve the problem. But we've developed this problem over 30, 40, 50 years. And it's, even if we replaced all the septic systems immediately, it's not going to end the problems that we have in our waterway. So I prefer a multi-pronged approach. Um, I think it's, uh, the town has appropriately targeted areas for greater uh, uh, bonuses when you want to replace a septic where it is really imminently a threat to waterways. And um, there are other gentler things that we can do that are kind of simple and old fashioned. We should be making more rain gardens. We should be planting more eelgrass. We can be using what they call these semi permeable barriers to control road runoff and the like. So I prefer a small town, multi pronged approach rather than one big borrowing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, Jeff, I'm going to start with you on this question. Uh, the village has long served as the cultural, commercial, religious, and educational center of the town. The congestion this imbalance creates has become untenable and has had a deleterious effect on quality of life for village residents. As the town grows, how do you see the town meeting the needs of its residents without placing further burdens on the village of East Hampton? And please be as specific as you can. 
Well, I, I'm aware of that. I, I hate to bring up a controversial case, but when, when we were discussing whether the library in the village should expand, there was a, a group of concerned residents and library supporters who made a very similar argument to this, that there was very limited parking at the, at the library and that when you look at the demographics of who they were trying to serve, which was largely uh, children, and I think there was some concern about serving working families as well, that it made more sense uh, to put a library annex in the springs. And we actually fought for that proposal. And I, so I'm aware of the problem of getting in and out of, of the village, and I agree to some extent that, um, and I did with the library, that, you know, it's really tough for working families and kids, especially after school or after work, to come into the village, find parking, or battle through summer traffic. So, um, you know, I, I would prefer to see uh, the hamlets better served with some of the services that uh, I think the village has taken over. There's, the village exists as this center, I think, just for historic reasons. Um, I, I actually think the village is pretty well managed. But I agree with you that the, uh, the continuing uh, surge of traffic in there is a problem. Um, I saw that recent, they recently published a, like a sort of a, a village study, a projection for the future, um, which, you know, the architects always like to put down their most progressive ideas. But the, the thing is, I like the village the way it looks now. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to preserve that as much as possible. And to the extent that the town could take up some of the slack and simultaneously help some of the hamlets around town to have some of the services, I'd support that kind of action. Okay, great. Thank you. In under two minutes. That's so great. <laughs> <laughs> can you see this? Can you guys see this? Uh, Keeping an eye kind on of it. Yeah, you can see. I just yeah. want you to I put it there so you could, so you have an idea where you are. Okay, Jeff. Uh, Jerry, sorry. Yeah, so the village is really a victim of its own success. I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful place. I've lived there, I've worked there most of my life, and it's the center of everything. The restaurants are located there. Um, I, I find it was funny that Jeff was saying he was fighting to put the library in Springs, but he was actually fighting to close, to not have the wing, the children's wing, put on the library. So I don't think that's the right approach. I mean, this is the center. We have to figure out uh, more parking, and, you know, it is the center. And if you go to Montauk, they have the same, the same problem in Montauk. You know, you have a lot of people in the business district. And the businesses, I mean, isn't that where you want the people? Shopping in your stores and eating in your restaurants. So I don't, unless we expand the business district, and I think that's what Jeff was talking about, this uh, thing that was recently in the store, this uh, depiction of a, of a perfect village or something. And they were going to expand the village down more towards the train um, station. And then I guess you could spread out the impact of the uh, congestion. But the congestion, that's where it's always going to be. It's, 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 it's the commercial center of our, of our township. So I don't know what else I can really tell you about okay, that. Okay, that's good. That's fine. Okay. Um, we're just going to go one more question. We're a little over time here. I'm sorry I'm not managing our budget very well. <laughs> uh, but... Um, just the way I have each pair evenly through the questions we've prepared. So um, the LIRR recently unveiled plans to heighten and reconstruct the train trestles at North Main Street and Akabonic Roads in the village. And we're wondering why the Stephen Hans Path trestle was not chosen instead. Um, widening that trestle, which has been long on our LIRR wish list, the village uh, preservation society in particular, would have far less impact on the community during construction and would have rooted truck traffic around the village rather than push it back into the village. Um, as most of the trucks that are heading north on North Main Street and Akabonic Roads are already headed out of town into the northern reaches anyway. Mm. So what would you do to address this issue for village residents? And um, ah, who did we start with last time? I think it's, Sorry, I, say, I think it's, it's my turn. It's yeah. your turn, Jerry. You're right. Well, Thank I don't you. think the village residents are going to like my answer. But okay. <laughs> Being in law enforcement for as long as I was and seeing some terrible accidents, and I agree that we should raise the train trestle at Stephen Hans, certainly widen it because it's dangerous on its own, in its own right, not being wide enough. But I, I am not uh, a proponent to send truck traffic around the village down back roads. It's not safe. There's no bike paths. There's no shoulders for you have joggers, you have bicyclists. You, it's just not a safe way to go. 
The safe way for trucks are on Route 27 until they get to where they have to turn off. And then if they have to traverse uh, back roads, you know, they have to. But to intentionally force them down back roads ahead of where they have to go off and divert them off of Montauk Highway, which is made for traffic, it has shoulders, it's a much safer place for the trucks to be. On top of it, these heavy trucks rip up our town roads and village roads. And that tax burden is on us to repave those roads, repair those roads. The state road comes out of a much bigger tax pool, as, we, as everyone would know. So I'm not in favor of raising the trestle for that specific reason of diverting tra 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 uh, truck traffic. OK, great. Yeah. Thanks. Jeff? I'd really like to see that trestle fixed, only because I vividly remember the first time I went through probably not looking carefully enough at the signs, and it felt like a high-speed game of chicken. I came, it was like within inches of this car, and I said, Whoa, this is a very dangerous place to live. So uh, I learned the hard way, and now I am extremely polite when I approach that trestle. Um, I would like to see it widened and raised for that reason. Just it's a safety reason. You know, trucks have collided with it. I'm glad they're raising the other two two trestles, and you know, I'm I'm not sure I have an opinion on this. I don't really know enough information about truck truck traffic, but what Jerry just said strikes me as having some sense to it. Um, I'd really I hate to I hate to give the old you know candidate answer of saying, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear from some traffic guys on this <laughs> to see what they think. I mean, I, I think we could probably live with, you know, paying for the upkeep on roads if it was a safer alternative. I generally believe in trying to make our communities slower, quieter, and calmer. So if that could be the effect of doing it, I'd be all for it. But I, you know, I'm a guy that's used to participating in environmental reviews, and I love to hear scientists and experts who know what they're talking about. And uh, it's, it's, these traffic guys often have a lot to say, so I'd like to hear from them. Okay. All right. Well, that was good. That helped me on the time budget. Thanks, guys. Uh, we got you back on <laughs> got, schedule. We're, we're a little better. We're yeah. a little better. So now we'll do our one-minute rebuttal. Did you have... I don't have anything. You don't have anything? Did you have something, Jeff? Oh, of course, if you're going to give me a minute. He's a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to say, yeah, the, uh, the town didn't violate the law uh, by, by pursuing uh, local control of the airport. I mean, there was, there was uh, uh, high level precedent that, that authorized the town to impose those local controls. I'm glad they did it. I think it was the right thing to do. And I think actually the decision that overturned them is incorrect. So, but I want to say that it, it, there is no a line of cases that indicates that, that we did something illegal by pursuing local regulations. We were following the national helicopter case, so we didn't waste millions of dollars. I don't think there's a good likelihood in that lawsuit that money is going to come out, have to come out of the general fund. Historically, communities have used fun, the uh, airport funds to fund these studies. And uh, I didn't really want to close the library. I, I want to jump to that subject to just say that we were very concerned the parking was inadequate. It really is still inadequate in the library. And we really were talking about how do you best balance resources to serve the place that has the most children, which was the Springs. Perfect. You guys were great. Thank you very much. Great. OK. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, uh, we're in our third pairing with uh, Jerry Larson, um, the Republican candidate and incumbent Democrat Kathy Burke-Gonzalez, Councilwoman Burke-Gonzalez. Um, we'll go through a second set of questions, and I think I'll start with Kathy to give you That's a little fine. break. Ladies first. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so what is your position on the Montauk Beach Restoration Project vis-a-vis -vis armoring the shoreline versus sand, and how will the town pay for the next installment of sand and engineered beach? And how will these programs extend to the rest of the uh, town, including the village and areas of Gardner's Bay? Okay, so, you know, the town, we need to adapt to changing conditions along our coastline. The way we look at the, uh, the downtown Montauk project, the beach stabilization project was a short term you know, while we wait for FIMP to come. We felt that we needed to protect the beach and to protect the businesses there. If you recall, after Sandy, if you looked at the hotels, there were septic rings that were, you know, exposed because that's how they were using uh, 
they were using the septic rigs to armor the beach there. We had an option uh, to either do nothing or rock revetment or the geotextile bags. We moved forward with the geotextile bags. The project had warts, but we felt that it was something that we needed to do. The next step, our medium term solution is FIMP, the Fire Island to Montauk Point project. That's a beach nourishment project that we are working with the Army Corps and on. they need to come out here soon and hopefully they'll start in Montauk and work their way down and dredge sand onto the beach. And then the long term process is we need to plan for retreat. And that's something that's come up in the Hamlet studies as well as the, uh, the CARP study, which we had gotten about, I guess it was over $400,000, the Coastal Assessment Resiliency Plan. And we need to figure out how to manage our shoreline, whether that's you know uh, land acquisition, water, waterproofing the beach if we have to uh, like flood proof the beach and put things, uh, raise pr uh, uh, septic systems and buildings and whatnot, and maybe you know buy out threatened properties. Okay, great, thank you. And economical, Jerry. Yeah, so I, I wasn't obviously involved when Kathy was involved with the town because when they were doing the whole Army Corps of Engineers study, but it just seems to me, I, I watched it in the process and I saw the dunes being ripped out and I think we should have left the dune and replenished the sand on the beach and not buried those geo bags. So that's what I would like to see done uh, moving forward is the sand replenished on the beach. I know the Fire Island, um, we're waiting and waiting for this. It's been around for a long time, and I think instead of waiting, we should be going out and, and, and dragging them here <laughs> and making them do it because it needs to be done. We're going to wind up losing the hotels. We're going to downtown Montauk. It's a huge economic resource for our community. Um, I read the Hamlet study. I, I'm not sure I agree with retreating from the coastline. I think our first plan of action should be to replenish the sand. And if Mother Nature takes something away, then maybe we can retreat that specific building. But to start thinking that we're going to start retreating from the coastline, I, I don't know how practical that is. Um, but I, I think going forward, we have to replenish the sand on that beach, and we should not have hard revetments down. It's, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not even in our coastal plan to do that. So that's how I feel about it. Okay, great. Thank you. Another economical answer. Love that. Okay, so Jerry, we'll start with you on okay. this. And this is in the same vein. Um, our communities are particularly vulnerable to coastal erosion, sea level rise, and extreme weather events. And the strength and ferocity of this hurricane season is a sober reminder of what we might expect. In your opinion, is retreat from the shoreline inevitable? If so, how do we pay for it? And what other tools will our community need to continue to thrive in a changing world? Hmm. Well, I have to agree with you. I mean, I think the climate the climate change, I mean, 97% of the, the climate scientists agree that, you know, the climate warming trends over the past century have been due to the human, the humans. <laughs> so is retreat inedible? I, I would say, you know, probably not in our lifetime. I think, as I said in the last question, we need to replenish the beaches. They do it all over the country, and, and as close as Sagaponic, they have taken the sand from the ocean and put it back on the beaches, build the beaches up, and let's start there. And I think, um, you know, moving forward, as far as paying for it, you know, we have to maybe set up a special district, a taxing district out in Montauk, or maybe for the whole town. These are things that have to be sit, sat down and discussed with everybody involved. And we need experts. Okay. Is that okay? Good. Thank you. We're just zooming right along. Okay. <laughs> Kathy? Well, this overlaps a little bit with what we talked about yeah. earlier. It did, yes. And so I, you know, we knew, do need to look at retreat, you know, uh, those, you know, along the downtown Montauk area, those hotels probably should never have gone there on our primary dune. And it's something that we need to look at. As Jerry said, a special taxing district is one option. We have to see if there's federal monies available, like we had with, um, that's funding FIMP through the, you know, after it's Hurricane Sandy and, and you know, funded the Montauk Beach Stabilization Project. So we need to work with our partners and the, pay, the state, the fed, federal government. And, uh, but, you know, retreat is probably something that is, you know, down the line. Okay. Wow. We are zooming through. That's excellent. Okay. So, Kathy, I'm going to um, start with you on this question. When a commercial activity impinges on the quality of life of town residents, 
what criteria would you use to determine if the nature of that activity is worth the trade-off for residents? Uh, uh, since we got into office, we had formed a, what we're calling now the Special Events and Film Permitting Committee. And I sit on that committee with Fred Overton, myself, uh, Chief Sarlo, uh, Buzzy, who's the, uh, I should be Buzzy, uh, Dave Brown, who is the Chief Fire Marshal, John Rooney from Recreation, uh, Francis Bach from the, from the town clerks, uh, Town, trust, town trustees and Nancy Linthia from the town attorney's office. So we're looking at this on a weekly basis. We meet every Thursday at 11 o'clock and we go through, you know, folks looking to do, for instance, Showtime's just been out here for a month and, you know, they had a lot of very big asks and we have to sit back and say, you know, we can't, we're not going to give up the beach on the weekends, you know, shoot in the shoulder seasons. We're constantly making those kind of decisions and we do it as a, as a group. It's a, you know, a very well-informed committee. And then that's how we, we are moving forward right now. There's a lot of tremendous coordination between departments in the town. And uh, we evaluate that on a weekly basis and it's, if, in fact, something's going to you know, have a deleterious effect on uh, neighborhoods and, and access to beaches and roads and things like that. OK, great. Thank you. So I, I take the question from a little different perspective. Um, I'm thinking more of the lines of like something that's pre-existing non-conforming, say like a, a restaurant that's in a residential neighborhood, and then after the restaurant hours it becomes a nightclub, and then it's disturbing the neighbors. And I think that has to be, you know, that has to be dealt with and has to end. It's not fair to the residents who are in that location, you'll hear the story that, you know, hey, the, the restaurant was here before. If you want to be a restaurant, that's fine. Be a restaurant, but you can't be a restaurant and a nightclub. So I think you have to draw the distinction and you have to protect our residents. Okay, great. Wow. Okay. Um, Jeff, uh, Jerry. Oh, gosh, I've got the Jerry Jeff thing going <laughs> on here. Um, it often appears that local government has spent the last 20 years reacting to change and hoping it goes away rather than planning for it. What are your plans for the hamlets within East Hampton to make sure we thoughtfully plan for the future we want rather than trying to fend off change in a reactionary fashion? What role will the business and hamlet studies play in your plans and what is your vision for East Hampton 20 years from now? Hmm. Well, I read through the hamlet study all, of, all the different Hamlet studies, and, and we just talked about the Montauk one. And we talked, moving to Wainscott, Wainscott has a uh, Hamlet study that basically says we should make it nicer and we should build more of more commercial districts. I mean, build a better commercial district in, um, in Wainscott and make it a nicer looking, and maybe use that pit for some commercial area and walking, walking areas and things like that. I think that's a great idea. I, I like that, that Hamlet study. Um, traffic. Traffic's a major problem. I don't know how you can fix the traffic problem. I have no idea how you're going to fix the traffic problem. I try to drive from here to, to, uh, to uh, Southampton in the summer. It could take you over an hour. So traffic is not something I think we can, we can fix. We can try to mitigate it. We can try to have some right turn onlys and maybe eliminate some traffic lights. You know, during certain uh, months, you can have right turn only out of certain roads and, and try to make the traffic um, travel a little a little faster but the congestion and like I said earlier question I mean Kathy wasn't here but you know we're a victim of our own success everyone wants to be here I mean we should almost be proud of that and we should figure out a way as we move forward to enhance what we have and somehow make it make it better I don't have all those answers I, I wish I did okay. <laughs> thank you Kathy? yeah you know I have to say that I'm Joe and I are very blessed that we're raising our kids here, and I always tease that in my next life I'm coming back as my kids <laughs> because nobody has it better. I mean, this is just such a beautiful place to grow up, our natural environment, but and the community here. You know, we're all you know, always looking out for one another and helping one another. You know, I want to look. My vision is to preserve and protect. You know, what's here. Uh, we talked a little bit about it in, in the earlier segments. You know, land preservation. You know, uh, over the last four years we've preserved. Um, over 300 acres. Uh, we've spent about $120 million in CPF money. We talked about the Long Island Railroad shuttle service, uh, circulator bus to move people around. Uh, you know, 
we haven't touched on yet affordable housing. You know, this administration, uh, we're working on 60 units. That's not enough. Uh, you know, I guess that's kind of like my one regret is that we haven't been able to do more affordable housing. It's, it's been a heavy lift uh, with the price of real estate here. Um, but I'd, I'd like to see, we're losing our 25 to 29 year olds. I'd like to see us, you know, uh, work with affordable housing, work with, work with job creation and, and keep our young people here so that we have a vibrant community. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Huh. So Kathy, you get, you mm -hmm. start with this one. Um, with McMansion scattered in neighborhoods with more modest homes, how should neighborhood character be treated within the zoning code? Is it desirable to achieve a balance, and how would you do so under zoning? Well, we actually, within the last probably eight months, have uh, approved new legislation. The, the, the old zoning code, or the old, old gross floor area calculation was that you could have 10% of your lot plus 1,600 square feet. And we probably had a discussion at four or five work sessions. This brought a lot of community members out, and it was a uh, number of people had their you know, positions and, and opinions about it. And we came to a consensus and, and changed the, the gross floor area to be 10% plus 1,200 so that you could, it would be a smaller house on, um, on, a, on the, the smaller lots. And uh, you know, I think that you know, we built consensus on that, and uh, I, I was very comfortable with that plan. Okay. Again, very economical. Jerry? Yes. <laughs> well, I think the, the zoning code, I mean, the zone, zoning is very important, obviously. But I think some of these bigger lots, like you have along, say, Lily Pond Lane, further lane, to be restricting the size of homes they can buy. I mean, it's not like they're in foreclosure. We have foreclosures going on. I mean, East Hampton, historically, and... and a lot of it's charm, and people come here to drive down these roads and see these big houses. You call them McMansions, but you know, people invest a lot of money and time and employ a lot of a lot of people from our community to work on these places. So, yeah, the small lots, absolutely. I don't think we should be imposing on our neighbors. But if you have a, a, a tremendous lot, I think you should be able to build a, a very big house if you'd like to. So, that's my feeling on it, and. Um, Okay. That's it. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, we're going to start with Jerry on this question. Okay. And you guys remember you have a minute rebuttal at the end of this, okay. right? You know, sure. if there's something you okay. want to challenge the other person on. Um, so there has been discussion that the planning process be modified to attract more low impact industries to our town. What would you suggest? And are there any incentives you can think of to achieve this goal? Well, years ago, the, uh, I think it was Tony Bullock's administration actually provided low-income startup houses, uh, startup businesses along Industrial Road by the, by the airport. And these people had to either provide a service or uh, employ a certain amount of people, whatever the restrictions were, that they met and they built these, these businesses. And they, they were responsible to build the buildings. And I think it was a great program. And we come along now, and the, the current town board is actually trying to evict at least five people that I'm aware of, including the uh, country uh, day school and the uh, GT Power Systems, Ed Sullivan um, Welding. And these people have had long-term leases, and the town is telling them that they can't find the paperwork, that they never renewed their leases. And this is the type of thing that we should not be doing to our residents. But this is the type of ideas that we should be coming up with to have these type of businesses start out in a low income, um, a cheaper way to get businesses out of, the, out of their homes and into uh, an industrial park, if you will. And I think that's a great resource and a great way to go. But we have to support those businesses. We can't, after 15 years, decide we're going to evict them. I mean, it's just horrible. OK, thank you. Um, work for me thank you okay Kathy well I think what we're finding with our young people is that a, a lot of them are becoming entrepreneurs and we need to look for ways to to, to partner with them you know public private partnerships uh, there may be you know we talked to someone uh, that was in the interested in using the CDCH building at one point 
and renting out space, kind of like a WeWorks. You know, you could think of, there's some folks that have been, been talking about that. Um, I mean, that's not gonna go forward at, at uh, CDCH at this point. We found a, a, a school that uh, wants to run it for special needs children, and they're gonna be presenting tomorrow at the work session. But something along those lines where, you know, people, as their businesses expand, they wanna move out of their homes, their home office, and that they have a place here to work and uh, develop their business ideas. I, I mean, another is to help, f you know, farmers. You know, that's a low impact uh, need here. And talking about industrial road, we've, we've leased a number of properties. What happens with the FAA is you have to charge fair market value. So we've leased properties. Before I got here, I took a ride down to see the landscape details because they've put up uh, a couple of buildings down there and have employ, you know, hundreds of people, of local people in our community. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so um, I am gonna ask you for um, a rebuttal and then we have our closing statement because we're in the mm -hmm. third space now. So you're, you'll have a minute for your closing statement. But the, um, I want to rebut, and then I want to ask you another question, and then I sure. want your closing okay. statement. Okay. So, are we clear on that? So, do you have a rebuttal? I do not. You, do no, you I have do it? Not. You don't either. All right, you guys have just been terrific. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> um, please, here's your eye, and you're doing it. <laughs> believe me. Um, this last question is: I'm going to ask you to say something nice about your opponent. Oh, that's very nice. Can I go first? You may. Oh, great. Um, I, I've known um, Kathy for a short time, mm -hmm. relatively, but I've known her husband longer, and I've actually known her kids more than, longer than, or her, her son anyway, longer than I've known Kathy. And by everything I see, I think she's a great mom, and I know her son goes to the same school as my wife's son, or my stepson, and um, Kathy seems to be a great mom, and I think she's a hard worker. Okay, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Jerry. And I was gonna say, you know, I don't know Jerry that well, um, but our boys went to school together, and they were in Boy Scouts together. So <laughs> I know Tristan through through Boy Scouts, and he's a fine young man. Oh, that's really sweet. Okay. Well, I love that. That works for Thank me. <laughs> okay. Now hold on. You've got your closing oh, statement. Right. Yep. So I'll uh, let you go first, Jerry or me? Kathy. She, you want to well, let her you finish? Yeah, she's you, sure. Oh, she's the you, I'll let. Okay. Yes. Okay. I think that's the way we'll do it. Okay. So thanks. Oh, I'm going to let Jerry go first, and you oh, can okay. close. Fine. Okay. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. In my capacity as police officer, a police detective, and eventually the police chief, I have a long history in East Hampton when it comes to enforcing the laws of East Hampton in New York State. No one else running in selection can claim they have done more than me. I also have a long history of helping the residents of our community in their times of need. I have also made it my mission to help provide young people in our community with jobs and careers with the police department and the emergency communications department. During the last 30 years, I've assisted or been directly involved in hiring numerous police officers, traffic officers, and public safety dispatchers. Hiring local men and women is so important so we can keep, our, keep a strong community like it was when I was growing up. I'd like to continue my hard work and dedication to our community by being elected to the town board. I'm asking for your vote on November 7th. Thank you. And thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. And we'll let Kathy finish. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you, Kathy, and, and thank you to the Village Preservation Society for, for sponsoring today's debate. Over the past four years, I've had the honor and privilege of serving the people of East Hampton. During this time, I've worked hard to address the serious issues that we face as a community, protecting the quality of our drinking water, surface waters and harbors and bays, addressing climate change and sea level rise, encouraging clean, renewable energy, securing local control of the East Hampton Airport, providing affordable housing opportunities for our local families, balancing our budget, improving mental health services for our adolescents that are dealing with depression and anxiety, and providing essential services for our seniors. But what I'm most proud of is how I've worked with my colleagues to restore dignity, respect, and civility to the business of the town board. And I'm asking for your vote on November 7th so I can continue to work and advocate on behalf of our children, our seniors, and our hardworking families. Perfect timing. Well, I will ask our viewing audience to stay tuned as we have our final pair, and I thank you both. I thank wish you luck in the upcoming thank election. Much. And thanks, thank Kathy. you. Thanks, and thanks, please Jerry. wait for Paul and Jeff. They'll be right back. 
Welcome back. This is our last pairing. Um, I have P Paul Giardina at, to my right. He'll be uh, the Republican, and Jeff Bragman, both uh, the Democrat, both challengers for town board. Um, we will address the next set of questions, and each candidate will have a minute closing statement in this segment. Um, okay, so I guess I'm just going to start with you, Paul, on this one. Uh, what is your position on the Montauk Beach restoration project vis-a-vis -vis armoring the shoreline versus sand? Uh, how will the town pay for the next installment of sand engineered beach? And how will these programs be extended to the rest of the town, including the village and areas along Gardner's Bay? Let me start by saying I think the town and uh, made the wrong decision with what they did. Um, it is very clear to me in hindsight that a large structure would have been the, the right way covered with sand to prevent beach erosion. So I think we made the wrong decision. But it was a tough decision to make any other way since four or five hundred people showed up at a meeting and didn't want any kind of, um, any kind of structure, not even the geotextiles. So until we can understand exactly what the right solution is, it's sand putting sand down and studying the problem and seeing if we need to move forward and to come up with a better plan. There are two things at play here, weather and climate change. And this is a weather issue. We're really, really dealing with an issue of storm surge. And storm surge is preventable. I know that people on the climate change area will say, well, Montauk will flood in, in the future. That's 50 years down, down the road, 40 years down the road. In the meantime, protecting the ocean beaches, not just in Montauk, but all around East Hampton, is a priority of mine. I don't want to see the beaches given back to the ocean. So I'm for a more progressive, uh, rather a, a more aggressive uh, approach to um, beach erosion. But in the meantime, we're going to pay for sand. Okay. Well, I have the advantage of being the Monday morning quarterback here. Um, and, you know, I've worked with the town and with uh, the planning department, and I use the comprehensive plan in the work that I do as an environmental advocate. And um, the policy of the town for really more than 30 years has been against beach hardening. And uh, I see what they did as a form of beach hardening. And I would not have gone that way. Now, I have to say, I have the benefit of hindsight. I'm not, I'm not the guy in the hot seat. And I will say that you know this Democratic board and generally Democratic administrations have been the most environmentally protective uh, env uh, uh, governments that we've had in the town of East Hampton. I'm actually rather surprised to hear Paul say that he would have been more aggressive and built, I guess, a stronger wall. I think the science is pretty clear that walling off our beaches is the wrong way to go and will actually uh, wind up in the loss of the beaches. Uh, so I, I, I think that our policy and our, uh, that, that's wrapped up in our local waterfront revitalization plan is the correct policy. I think they made the wrong call. Um, and I also think we've got to worry about um, storm surge and climate change in the much shorter term than uh, what uh, Paul was indicating. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have watched the town start some of the planning on uh, coastal uh, resiliency planning and um, kind of uh, it's it was a fun uh, exercise in democracy not always peaceable there was some bickering and argu arguing but uh, it looks to me like they're you know they've got the right people to make judgments on the basis of science not apathy not fear and uh, so I think they're headed in the right directions and I think the Army Corps is going to pay for the sand replenishment in the near future and ultimately this is linked to a sand only restoration plan from Fire Island to Montauk. This was a way to get Montauk included in that Fire Island and Montauk plan. Okay. Okay, well, this next question is uh, related, um, and I'm going to start with you. Yes. Um, our communities are particularly vulnerable to coastal erosion, sea level rise, and extreme weather events. And the strength and ferocity of this hurricane season is a sober reminder of what we might expect in our community. In your opinion, is retreat from the shoreline inevitable? If so, how do we pay for it? 
and what other tools will our community need to continue to thrive in a changing world? Uh, I do, you know, I, I'm glad to talk about this because it's, you know, it's impressive to me that a small town like East Hampton facing a really big problem can actually undertake the planning uh, to decide what to do. And I think this coastal area resiliency plan that they call CARP, the acronym is CARP, um, really is kind of exciting, although it's a little rough and tumble. I mean, there was a, there was a gentleman at one of the meetings that I attended who said, oh, you guys don't know anything about hurricanes. I was there in Katrina. We were pulling bodies out of trees 15 mm -hmm. feet off the ground. And the guy, the guy running the show was a PhD, a, a scientist, and usually they're not great MCs. They're kind of dry. But, and, and he actually said, look, look, we're not going to give in to fear. We're not going to give in to apathy. We're going to use the best science we had. And he showed how they charted you know, all the storm events that they had had, including the 1938 hurricane. So I think that this CARP planning is, is a good way to go. Do I think uh, retreat, which I think they're now calling adjustment, <laughs> is uh, probably going to be necessary? Yes, it probably is. There are zoning tools that they can use uh, to encourage people. They can. Um, they can do incentive zoning, particularly in Montauk, is where we're, we're, we're they're thinking there's going to be have to be more retreat. They can do um, taxing districts so that they can they can encourage uh, motel owners who get hit to move further inland um, and take advantage of those kinds of uh, statutory uh, changes that they can make. Interestingly, a lot of the, the hits from uh, sea level rise are going to come on the bay side, which surprised me, over near my house on Swamp Road and some of the other bay communities. Um, it's sort of paradoxical, but the ocean side isn't going, to, isn't going to see submergence as much as the bay side is. But I think it's pretty exciting that they're talking about it. They're talking about it realistically. They are going to come up with a plan, and it looks like they're going to have some good ideas. Okay, great. Jeff and I disagree on this point. Okay. Um, most important to remember is that hardening um, beaches with structures has worked in North Carolina and in other areas. I was involved in Hurricane Hugo in the Virgin Islands, where areas that remained uh, in reasonable shape were protected as such. So I, dis I dispute the science completely on that. As far, we need to understand there is a difference between climate change and weather. We are having a strong hurricane season, no doubt. And yes, Jeff is right. The storm surge is going to be um, much stronger, usually, on the north side of the peninsula. However, before we start looking at retreat, and I understand that that is a realistic possibility with climate change, which, if the climate goes up 0.8 degrees Fahrenheit, then the sea level rise that would affect and affect a climate change uh, move would be years away, years away. So right now there are businesses on the shoreline that need to be protected. This is an income generating area. Montauk generates more revenue than any other resort area in Suffolk County. It needs to be protected, it should be protected. And yes, at some point if we don't protect it, as I said before, we'll be paying for the sand, which is why I'm looking for a better solution now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so um, we'll go to you with this one, Jerry. Uh, when a commercial activity impinges on the quality of life. I'm Paul. Paul. He's Paul. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. gosh. I have, I have Jerry written I, down here. I was here. almost going to jump in at Jeffrey. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, Lord. Okay. Forgive me, Paul. It's quite all Jardina. Right. <laughs> Um, when a commercial activity impinges on the quality of life of town residents, what criteria would you use to determine if the nature of that activity is worth the trade-off for residents? Can you be more specific in what you mean about a commercial activity? Well, we have a variety of them in our community. Um, it could be anything from uh, companies that come in here to run, you know, businesses just for the season or... Uh, pre-existing non-conforming uses in a residential area, you know. Okay, we have a town. Either of those, or there are others I'm sure we can think of if we spend more time on it. We have a town code, mm -hmm. and the town code is what drives these kinds of issues. I live 
down the street from a uh, pre-existing non-conforming business called Round Swamp Farm. And at times during the summer, that's a very busy area. And yet parking restrictions and other types of things handle that pretty adequately. So the question is, it's code enforcement of a reasonable code. And then when we start getting into pre-existing non-conforming issues, such as Paddle Diva, something like that, we have to use good judgment. Are we, uh, do we have a commercial venture that is good for this, good for this area, good for the town, productive without harming people and their property rights and other rights? Well, you know, I deal with the zoning code and have dealt with the zoning code for almost 30 years now. And um, the longer I'm here, the more I see that the battles that I thought were won years ago have to be refought. And I think the one constant in, in this dynamic of the, the push-pull between um, preserving what we have and, uh, and uh, the development money that comes in um, is that we have a neutral planning uh, process that we have strict enforcement of COs, whether the use is pre-existing, non-conforming, or a new use, and that we have rigorous zoning enforcement. Uh, you know, I've been fighting a battle against um, a, uh, a drug rehab, a very high-end drug rehab uh, facility that came in under Republican administrations when they basically um, gave it a free pass and didn't make it go through the planning board or the zoning board, both of which it, it, it needed to do. So I'm a, a pretty strict enforcement guy. I mean, I've lived through it when mom talk, you know, when the Republicans got up and said publicly, uh, you know, it's summer, get used to it. And ultimately, you know, mom talk, people who are involved in the businesses, who care and are good neighbors with their businesses came in and said, you have to do something here because these clubs and restaurants are, are ruining our lives. And it was the Democratic administration that came in and actually, you know, beefed up enforcement. Enforcement has been increased. I've been at meetings in Montauk. They are, you know, that business community, we, the board is attending to that business community. They know it. Um, and I'm surprised at, at the benefits that they've done. They've, they've quieted down traffic. They've got a bus running now. They've taken care of the mess that Uber made. So, but my fundamental position is, you got to get tough on zoning. You have to insist that uses comply with their C of O's. And if they don't, you do have to go to court and you have to fight. And if you fight one or two cases, people become compliant because they know you mean business. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Jeff, I'm going to start with you on this one. It often appears that local government has spent the last 20 years reacting to change and hoping it goes away rather than planning for it. What are your plans for the hamlets in East, within East Hampton to make sure we thoughtfully plan for the future we want rather than trying to fend off, excuse me, change in a reactionary fashion? What role will the business and hamlet studies play in your plans, and what is your vision for East Hampton 20 years from now? Well, I know I can't preserve East Hampton exactly as it is, but I do like to say if I could make things quieter, calmer, and slower, I would do anything to do that. Um, you know, we do react sometimes because some of the changes that we encounter are quicker, um, you know, like um, uh, what's, I'm trying to, the, um, what's the rental, uh, the online rental group that oh, Airbnb. At Airbnb took over, they take over very rapidly, and they basically exploded the summer rental market and made enforcement very difficult. And yes, the town did have to play catch up, and they enacted the rental registry, which I think was a great idea and very effective. I think um, on, on the hamlet, on, on the question of what's going to happen to the hamlets, this is an example of the town doing a better job of being proactive because we're already engaging the public on these hamlet study plans. And, you know, again, there's been some contention there. I've watched them. Um, in the, you know, if you put a bunch of architects and designers together and say, here's Amagansett, give us a vision, you know, they start putting in new uses and expanding and, you know, putting in new stores. And interestingly, the feedback that they got in a lot of the Hamlet studies, not just Amagansett, was, no, we, we like the Hamlet the way we have it. We can, we can take adjustments that will make it more efficient. We can take 
um, additions to buildings to put some affordable housing in where it won't wreck the center of the hamlet as we know it. But we don't fundamentally want to change it. And interestingly, the studies are, they've been good. I mean, I, I listened to some planners and they were saying, we don't need any more retail space. And we learned that from getting pushback from people, but also by studying the economics of what's going on in East Hampton. So I'd like to see North Main Street better aligned. I'd love to see a library in Springs. Um, I'd like to see Amagansett's uh, Main Street and Hamlet Center stay pretty much as it is with neighborhood business zoning. Wayne Scott, I don't want to see a car wash there. Wayne Scott really needs a village green or something of that sort. And Montauk's got a, you know, a, a good plan for installing septic and their Hamlet study plan overlaps the car plan a little bit. Okay, great. Thank you. Paul. 80% of the homes in this town our second homeowner uh, uh, residences, 20% are local. This has caused uh, a schizophrenia in how we approach what we're doing in this town. What we don't have enough of is housing for people who graduate from high school here in East Hampton. We don't have enough housing for our legal workforce here in East Hampton. And we are at the point of close to having 5,000 seniors here, many of whom will have to consider alternative housing, which they can afford for health reasons. In the last few years, we have put less than 50 new housing units on, and some of those were started in the Wilkinson era. I have said very, very, very distinctly, we need in each of the hamlets to have housing solutions. And we've got to stop beating up on some of these towns, or some of these hamlets that have faced the brunt of it. For instance, the town is now negotiating with the Cavalry Baptist Church for three acres of land. This is another burden that would be put on the Springs Fireplace Road between 85 and 95, where they're also putting in a museum at the Fowler House, to say nothing of the uh, traffic coming from the Springs. We need to look comprehensively, and we got to get rid of not in my backyard. Each five hamlets, each of the five hamlets, have to look at their needs, whether it's workforce, whether it's high school graduates who are uh, employed within 30 or 50 miles here, and that's really what I think the key to where we're going. Hamlet studies are wonderful, but we need housing. We need housing to make this town work for our seniors, for our high school kids, and for our legal workforce. Wow, right on the nose. Okay. Oh, you're agreeing with me, or is that just no? The timing, the timing was right. Well, <laughs> no, I can't agree. That's I'm I'm a moderator. I am just moderating. But um, the I love it when you guys are uh, ti the timing works. So I think I started with Jeff on that one, right? Yes. So then I'm going to start with Paul on this one. Um, with McMansion scattered in neighborhoods with more modest homes, how should neighborhood character be treated within the zoning code? Is it desirable to achieve a balance, and how would you do so under zoning? You know, there's two ways to look at this. The one way that I like to look at is if I'm calling for affordable housing or housing solutions, as I prefer to call it, we've got to look at all neighborhoods. And in balancing this out, we're not going to want to build some facilities for affordable housing that completely wreck the streetscape and the landscape. So if we're going to put south of the highway affordable housing, then maybe we should put trees all around it just like people do with mansions and 40 bedrooms. I don't know. Is that an idea? Um, I think what we need to do is match streetscapes and landscapes with what we're building. And I'm most concerned about housing solutions. As long as we can keep multi-unit housing solutions when we need it in the character of the neighborhood they're in, then I think we'll be better off. This will also help us really get rid of the not in my backyard uh, solution. Um, there are 15 acres for sale just down the street from me in Three Mile Harbor, and I've got three to five acres in the back, which perfectly willing to talk to people about. 
And I've proposed a public-private partnership. And I've already talked to some of the big landowners, some of the big construction companies who can do this, make money on it, are willing to do it, and do it without government money. What we need is the structure in each town, uh, excuse me, each hamlet, to come up with the guidelines of what we need, how we're going to build it, and what it's going to look like to conform with the neighborhood. Okay, great. Jeff? You know, when I started out as a lawyer in East Hampton, I got hired by Judith Hope back in 1985 when they just passed the, the new zoning code, which is the code that we have now. And Judith had a, one very good rule about affordable housing, which was it can't break through zoning. It has to comply with zoning. That was her rule of thumb because it wouldn't be acceptable in the neighborhoods where you wanted to place affordable housing if in some way you were putting lesser housing in. So I think that's a good rule. On house sizes in neighborhoods, I think we could revisit our zoning code and, and examine the size houses that we permit, I think it's somewhat excessive, and that is something I'd be willing to do. Um, I actually agree with Paul that, that housing affordability is a big issue, um, and I, I, I'm also concerned about uh, the young kids and the young adults, I call them young kids, I have a 29-year-old who would like to live in East Hampton, and I agree that they need, there needs to be a way that we can get them living here. I think we could also expand, carefully expand, the use of detached apartments over garages. A lot of people that age out want to age out and move into a smaller space and rent the house that they have to a kid, a, a relative. Um, some jurisdictions allow, allow them to do it to workers that they consider to be critical to the economy, ambulance, uh, EMTs, and teachers, and the like. So those are some ideas um, that could help. And um, I think that, uh, that this housing affordability thing is affected by some of the development that we're permitting. Some of these, I mean, I'm currently fighting a house in the, in the village of uh, Southampton, admittedly in a wealthy area. It is 15,000 square feet. But to bring it closer to home, I've driven uh, in the Amagansett lanes recently where I lived for many years. You can't recognize the lanes anymore. Those lanes are now filled with these, the houses that every spec owner is building, these large houses that have all the facilities. So I think we have to use a multi-pronged approach that fits into the character. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna do one more question. Um, Actually, yeah, I'm going to skip one of these because we're running a little long here. And because uh, I want you to have your one minute rebuttal and then you have your closing statement. So we're about, we've got about five minutes to go here. So um, first, I'd like you to do your rebuttal if you have something. Do you have a rebuttal? Yeah. Uh, Jeff talked about revisiting the zoning code so that we could put affordable housing. But you also uh, mentioned Judith Hope saying, well, we don't want to change the neighborhood by putting something inappropriate in it. This is not in my backyard thinking. Jeff's talking about fighting this, fighting that, fighting this. I don't want to fight this. What I want to do is put my arms around the problem, welcome everybody, and look in each hamlet where we can look for as many as a thousand units which are really solutions to our housing needs. I don't want to call it affordable housing. I want to call it housing that meets our needs. We can't fight about this. Revisit the zoning code, you bet. I want to revisit the zoning code, and I'm sure willing to look to put affordable housing wherever, including my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I have to laugh at that a little bit. I'm sorry, Paul, but calling Judith Hope a not-in-your-backyard person on affordable housing is uh, uh, pretty much rewriting history since Judith Hope was the most effective uh, town supervisor in terms of building affordable housing, including Whalebone 1, Whalebone 2, the Akabonic Apartments. All of these things were part of the Judith Hope vision, and her idea about making affordable housing comply with zoning is a winning, workable idea because it fits into our neighborhoods. And you know what? We have public-private partnerships right now. We have 
we have town board members who are looking at locations to put affordable housing in. We have the Manor House project that's ready to break ground. We have another one in Amagansett. So things are on the move, but I'll agree with you to this extent. My philosophy on affordable housing is get it done. That's what I'd like to see. And I've stated publicly that I would have liked to have seen affordable housing in Wainscott, where there was tremendous pushback uh, from the community. I think, in part, they were concerned legitimately about the school, but I think we could have solved that problem. And we can get affordable housing, but I think we better key it in size to the size town we have. Talking 1,000 units is pretty, pretty grandiose. Okay. okay. All right. Well, now we're going to change energy, and I'm going to ask you to say something nice about your opponent. That's our last question. That's the last question. It's the last question. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I don't know Paul very well. We, we've only met a couple times in public, but what I do uh, welcome uh, from him is his background in science. I think it's very refreshing uh, to see a Republican candidate that actually believes in science, will talk science, and has a science background, and I think that's quite a, quite a difference from what I see on the national scene, so I'm happy to have him in the debates with me. Great. Okay. Paul. Well, I'd like to reiterate what uh, Jeffrey said. Um, I think we met at um, um, an art show in the Springs in Ashawag Hall for the first time, and um, Jeff commented on my dog Dozer, and he mentioned he had a dog, and he's a family man, I know, as am I. And I think we probably have the same goals in mind. Um, we don't want to change this town uh, to the point where we ruin it, but we know changes are, are necessary. So um, from all I can tell, meeting Jeff three times, I think his feet hit the ground. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Great. <laughs> Okay, so now we'll have our closing statement. Um, so, Paul, do you want to go first? Sure. In, pro in promoting my candidacy, I really want to bring together Republicans, Democrats, and independents in a spirit of cooperation and community love. I want to be everyone's town board officer. Bonnikers, more recent arrivals, the old and the young, the wealthy, the indigent, Latinos and Anglos. At the same time, I promise to be grounded in long-term, long-standing Republican principles, to marshal our tax resources carefully and responsibly, to encourage personal responsibility, to require respect and admiration for law enforcement, military, veterans, and our system of justice, and to honor our Constitution. This will be a nonpartisan and multipartisan campaign. I want to welcome you and welcome those who regardless of who you voted for in the last time or what your registration is to move with us. In the words of one of my favorite presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, do what you can with what you got where you are. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jeff. Well, you know, I'm, uh, I've been the endorsed candidate of the Democratic Party, the Independence Party, and the Working Families Party. And uh, I don't mind describing myself as a fighter because that is what I've been doing for 30 years, but fighting to protect the things that we love about East Hampton, its history, um, its water and the natural resources, the things that uh, make it so special. But the lesson that I've learned uh, from fighting is not to be a fighter. It's really um, the importance of listening to local residents because uh, I don't actually believe in NIMBYism. I, I, I trust local residents and I listen to them because they're filled with local knowledge. And they usually know best what's best for their neighborhoods. And um, I just, if, if I could do anything, I, I'd like to just say that I, be, I believe in our local government. I know we're a small town, but uh, I really think that if we would listen to each other more and shout at each other less, that we can get things done using uh, the honest rule of law. And, really move into the future. I know we're a small town, but I think that we can do big things if we work together, and I'd like to help do that. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Well, thank you both for your time. I want to thank uh, all of our candidates uh, for their time and participation in this really important discussion of issues of concern to our community. I want to thank you for our v viewing audience for joining us, and um, to remind you that Election Day is Tuesday, November 7th, and you should get out and vote. As my father used to say, if you don't 
exercise your right to vote, you lose your right to complain. <laughs> so exercise your franchise Amen. and vote. <laughs> Goodbye. No one wants uh. to.